Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to this session on cybersecurity for graduate student research. I'm very happy to be joined by Allison Henry, Berkeley's Chief Information Security Officer, James Duncan from Research IT, and Aaron Hancock from the Information Security Office to be talking to speak all of you speaking on this awesome topic. So I'll now hand it over to Allison to get us started. Great, thank you very much. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So um, I'm Allison Henry, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer, and that means that I run the Information Security Office. So if you're not familiar with us, a little bit about what we do, um, we monitor the network, and that means we're looking for the bad guys breaking into computer systems, compromising them, and then letting people know so they can get cleaned up and fixed. Um, we resp respond to incidents, both you know minor, small things, and you know very huge, serious issues. Um, but we don't want to just be there when the bad things happen. We want to stop them. So we do risk assessments. We look at systems and see what are their weaknesses. How can we get them fixed? We develop policies to help make sure everybody knows what they need to do. And then we do things like this, coming in and speaking to all of you to make sure that you have the information you need to protect yourself. Um, but what I really want to emphasize here is that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the work of securing our um, systems and data. We can't be everywhere, um, just the distributed nature of the campus makes that impossible. And so we really rely on all of you to do the majority of the security work here. And that includes making sure your systems and data are secure, understanding what our policies are, making sure that data is registered and inventory, putting controls in place, and then letting us know if you notice something bad happening. So um, that's part of why we're here today is to give you the tools you need to play the role that you have to play in information security. Um, and specifically, since we're talking about, about research here, I wanna talk about the threats to research. So I'm gonna start with what we call the intentional threats. So these are the bad guys. These are the people who are out to do something malicious with bad intentions. Um, and we categorize, there's four basic categories and there are you know, crossover and, and some gray areas, but generally we think about Nation state sponsored attacks where the, the aim, the motivation here is to advance one nation's programs, political agendas, economy over others. Um, then we also have criminal motivation. So they're just trying to steal things and uh, get extract money, just like any other criminal enterprise. Um, you also have nations with an ideological motivation. They um, sometimes called hacktivists. They're trying to stop something they don't believe in or maybe advance something that they do. And then we also have malicious insiders who have their own personal motivations for wanting to disrupt uh, research steal data. So um, I'm gonna dive into a few more of these. So next slide, we'll start with um, nation state sponsored. I know these are the ones that make the flashy news headlines. So you've probably heard some about these already just reading news. Um, one of the big focuses now when it comes into uh, the research area in the US are China's programs to you know, advance their economic agenda through espionage and specifically targeting research in American institutions. And so, um, there have been some high profile cases where researchers were recruited by the Chinese government to come to the US and steal research data. So that is one form of a cyber attack. Sometimes they're, they're trying to get information out of systems or you know, take the information out of the country. There have been a case where a researcher was caught with data that they should not have had on a USB drive trying to leave the country. Um, and the US government is definitely very interested in this area right now and making sure that US institutions are aware of these threats. Uh, next slide. Um, it's not just China though. There's certainly um, other countries with uh, in espionage programs. Um, there's a fairly large hacking group associated, associated with the Iranian government who's been targeting um, institutions, including US universities. They have this uh, attack where they try and steal credentials to log into library systems. And then that's a way to get a username and password associated with a researcher because researchers are all going to the library. Um, and then there was a similar attack from North Korea where they were targeting um, biomedical engineering researchers. And again, trying to fake them into thinking this is a library login page in order to steal their usernames and passwords. Um, it's not always clear exactly why they're targeting these specific research areas, but it gives you an idea that they're, they're 
They're looking at specific areas of research where they want to advance their country's programs. It might not always be just about espionage, though. There could also be other motivations like destruction of data or setting another, um, in another country's research programs back. And we did see this with COVID-19 research, where research into COVID-19 vaccines and treatments were targeted. There were some attacks that were specifically on um, supply chains, so like the cold storage requirements for the vaccine. Um, there were attacks on companies that were doing research and, and working in this area. So again, it's not known, are they just trying to steal the data or maybe even destroying data in order to set another nation's programs back to their advantage? So I think even though it's, it's not quite as flashy when it comes to geopolitical uh, arena, but definitely in the news as well is the ransomware scourge. So every week, it seems like I hear about another university or health center that's been targeted with ransomware. It's extremely destructive. It's um, not just to the, like, when we think about data, we think a lot about data protection and there's regulatory requirements. This data has to be, the confidentiality has to be protected, um, or we have to notify people that their data was exposed. But sometimes it's just the critical nature of the data itself. It's so important to keep business running that we have our IT systems in place. Um, so when the attackers demand these payments, we pay just because, you know, in some cases, people's lives may be on the line. Um, and there was a really unfortunate case where a woman died because she was not able to be admitted to a hospital that was experiencing a ransomware attack. And this was at a, a university medical center. Um, so we've also seen cases where a, an institution is targeted, ransomware is deployed, they pay the ransom, and then the attackers come back in because they never fixed the problem. They never stopped the, the they never locked the door, so to speak. So um, an institution, once they're known to be vulnerable, can be exploited over and over again. So, um, I just think about this in terms of how much we depend on our IT systems for research and what the impact is, not just to the data itself, but the systems not being available while you try and figure out how to recover them. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about what happened at UCSF because this was such uh, you know, a, a really impactful and highly publicized case of a UC institute, research institution being targeted with ransomware. Um, I know a lot's been said on this already. I do wanna give just a couple of highlights. If you're not familiar with it, I really recommend looking at some of the news stories about this. Um, but what happened was that a very large research institute at UCSF was compromised with ransomware and their entire IT infrastructure just for this one institute was, was compromised. So it was massive, massive amounts of data that were involved. Um, and they ended up paying the ransom a substantial sum of money, even after paying the ransom. And this is, we've seen this at other institutions as well. It doesn't mean like the next day your data is back. It takes a very long time to recover. For weeks and weeks and weeks, all the systems are down um, and they're, it's a slow process. And through that whole process, you're never even sure if all of the data is going to come back. So what really struck me about UCSF and some of these other types, very similar um, events have happened at other institutions all over the country, is just how impactful that is for the researchers who have depend on this data, who need this data to just wake up one day and be told, we don't have your data and we don't know if we can get it back. So, you know, I just invite you to think about that with the research data that you're working with you know, what would happen if you came in and tried to open a file and instead of the file, there was a note saying, you know, go to this Bitcoin address. Um, how do, have you thought about your backups? Have you tested them? How confident would you feel that you can get your data back and what would be the impact if you couldn't? All right, next slide. <laughs> So on that somber note, I do want to say a little bit about how the attackers get in in these cases, what we've seen and what we've heard of happening in other institutions. The number one way is phishing. So I mentioned this before when we talked about the you know, North Korea and Iranian campaigns where they're trying to steal library credentials. 
you know, typically it's an email that comes in and it says your library account is going to expire. You need to click here to log in and, you know, accept our new terms, something like this. And sometimes they can be incredibly targeted. If they're trying to reach a specific person or a specific lab, it can be very, very convincing. There is absolutely no shame in falling for these things. It's not like it's always obvious what it is. Um, the other main way we see here, and we see this quite a bit, is um, open remote access. So they need to get access to the machine itself some way in order to install ransomware or delete files or you know, exfiltrate data if that's what they're going for. And especially now where we're all working from home, um, but even before, people turn on RDP, SSH, VNC, TeamViewer, all of these tools in order to be able to work from anywhere. Um, if all you need is an internet connection and a password, then eventually the attackers will get in. That's just not sufficient security because it's really easy, again, the phishing example, to get a password. And then once you have uh, a way in, a username and a password, that's it, it's game over. Um, we also see vulnerable web applications being exploited. So if you, you know, maybe there's a scientific instrument and it has a web interface in order to go in to program it, that if it's exposed to the internet and it has a weak password or a vulnerability from the vendor, that's one way we see people getting in. And then again, if you, if you are talking about, you can have somebody who's recruited and who actually comes in and plugs a USB drive in to get data to exfiltrate it. So, or somebody maybe in a, a disgruntled person who comes and starts deleting files or destroying backups or something like that. <laughs> so what do, what do attackers do? They, they've got your username and password, they've logged in through RDP, what's their next steps? So what we see is the first thing they wanna do is be able to get back in anytime they want. So they establish some kind of backdoor so that even if you, you know, remove RDP or turn it off, they're still gonna be able to get in. The next thing they do is try and reach out and find as many other systems. They've gained a foothold, but they don't want just data on one system. They want to find that server connected to that workstation or that cluster. And they're just going to start branching out, stealing credentials along the way, logging into systems. They're going to start looking for um, audit logs and backups, because if they can destroy the, the security logs, then it will stop us from realizing what's happening. Of course, if you want to get a ransom, it's much easier if the backups are gone too. So they're going to use those stolen passwords and credentials to try and delete backups. If there's any data that's valuable, they're looking for those crown jewels, something that's you know on their radar or some, that might be worth money or worth something in terms of their motivations. Um, find it, exfiltrate, that just means they copy it off and take a copy for themselves and then either encrypt or destroy what's left. So that's just a little bit of the damage that we see going on. Okay, so the other piece that people don't always think about but is just as destructive when it comes to data are the unintentional threats. So it's not always a bad guy. Sometimes it's just bad things that happen to good people. So if you go to the next slide, a few examples of this. Um, First of all, there's just mistakes. Sometimes you copy data to a USB drive because you need to get it from one system to another, and then you lose the drive, you drop it, um, and then it can get in the wrong hands that way, or maybe you just lost a copy of the data. Maybe you accidentally deleted something you didn't mean to. Um, there's also vulnerabilities in software that can expose data. So um, there was this case here where uh, admissions data was exposed because the university was running a version of software that was no longer supported and it was known to have this vulnerability that they couldn't fix. So that, that's another thing to be aware of is that sometimes um, not keeping up to date with patches can result in an unintentional exposure of data. And then of course in California, we're just no strangers to natural disasters and bad things happening, fires, earthquakes, floods, power surges, all of these things can be very damaging to computer systems. Um, there was a case in our own data center a few years ago where a server caught fire and um, the fire suppression system in the data center did exactly what it was supposed to do, but that also um, can be very destructive when water starts spraying down on stuff. So. Um, again, these are, these are reasons why we need backups and we need to think about data very strategically, not just because of the bad guys, but because bad things happen.
All right. So I want to leave you with just five things, because I know this is a lot of information. A lot of it's kind of scary and depressing. Um, but I want like five takeaways, things that you can do today to help address these threats. Um, so the first one is know where your data lives. You can't protect what you don't know about. Um, so when, when I talked about thinking about what would be the impact if this data was gone, think about that data. Where is it? Where are the copies of it? What systems do I need to focus on in order to protect the most precious, most critical resources here? Um, and then once you find those places and make sure you know where the data is, the first thing to do is make sure it's backed up because this is gonna address both the intentional and unintentional threats that could result in a loss of the data. So if you love your data, flat back it up. I recommend at least two backups because if one fails or wasn't configured right or didn't work out, you have a backup of the backup. Um, and the other thing is making sure that you back it up the right way, that you have an offline copy, meaning that if somebody breaks into the computer being backed up, they can't get access to delete the backup itself. Um, and Research IT is going to be able to help you with this. So when we get to their part, um, their consulting services can really help you because I know that it can get complicated. Um, the other one when you saw from the phishing and the RDP remote access is strong passwords and um, two-factor authentication. So, you know, if you log into cache, you've got to do the duo two-step wherever two-factor is available, turn it on. Um, make sure you have a unique password for every site that you use. And we have LastPass Premium. There'll be a thing tomorrow. I hope you can make it to that one if you haven't started with LastPass because that is the key in making sure that a password still in one place can't get into something critical like your research data. Um, so then the other piece is those systems that have your data, they have to be maintained. They have to be configured with security standards in mind. And so that's why I'm so grateful that Aaron can come today and talk to you a little bit more about what that looks like. And then if all of this is too much and you need help, then ask for help. So our research IT is going to come up next to talk about how they can help. And you're always welcome to email security at berkeley.edu and we're here to help as well. So I'll take a pause there if there are any questions. Just a reminder folks that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll definitely collect them so we can answer them at the end. Great, thank you so much, Allison. And at this moment, I will hand it over to James to talk about research IT. Yeah, thanks, Aaron and Allison. Um, hi, everybody. I'm James Duncan. I'm a domain consultant with Research IT and Berkeley Research Computing in support of the Savio High Performance Computing Cluster and a PhD student in biostatistics. Um, and as we just heard from Allison, security events and loss of data can be quite costly. They can also have a negative reputational effect on UCB researchers on their labs and as on the campus as a whole. Um, so today I'm gonna to give you an overview of the tools, technologies, and services that are available to you to protect your data, your research, and most importantly, yourself, um, and to help make the research effort a success. So at Research IT, we provide research data and computing technologies, consulting and community, for the UC Berkeley campus to advance research through IT innovation. Um, and where the interface between researchers and the many options you have available to you on campus for security, data, and compute. Campus has quite a few tools and we help researchers to navigate through it all. And we also advocate for researcher needs and perspectives. So we're poised at the intersection of research and technology and can help identify cloud, high-performance computing and virtual machine solutions. Um, and we have expertise in topics of data security, data management, and we help researchers to understand the sensitivity of their data and how to use it, how to back it up and protect it. Next slide, please. And just as important as the tools and technology are the people, the community and partnerships. And this includes the library and shared research data management program, as well as the IST or information services and technology team, which provides infrastructure and in support of the secure research data and computing platform 
which I'll talk about more shortly. Um, Savio, the high performance computing cluster on campus and analytics environments on demand or AAD, which provides scalable virtual workstations um, for specific domain needs. And ISD helps all of these organizations by providing support for networking and security infrastructure, data storage systems and data center operations. Um, beyond that, there's our partner up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which provides world-class experts in support of our operations at BRC and our HPC clusters. Um, and also on this slide, I have just a small sampling of some of the upcoming community opportunities that we have, including events like the cloud computing meetup, which happens monthly, um, conferences like the Women in Data Science um, at UCB conference, which is happening in March, and then community working groups such as the Securing Research Data Group, which meets monthly. And finally, trainings like Intro to HPC with Savio, where I'll be speaking tomorrow with a couple of my colleagues from Research IT. Um, we're also working with partners from across campus to uh, create a service known as the Secure Research Data and Compute Platform. And this platform is designed for researchers with highly sensitive data at the P4 protection level. Um, and right now researchers are using the secure Windows-based virtual machines that are available on SRDC, and also a secure HPC cluster and secure data storage offerings are available for early adopters. Um, and baseline capacity on SRDC is completely free to the researcher. The SRDC platform has been designed and built for a broad range of researchers. And for example, our first project is with folks from the Health and Human rights program at the Human Rights Center in the law school. And they're using a secure VM to work on highly sensitive human subjects data. We're also working with several other research groups um, to evaluate their needs, including the School of Public Health, uh, Department of Computational Biology, Department of Statistics, the School of Social Welfare, and Department of Political Science. At Research IT, we have a team of experts from across domains that help facilitate access to computing and data resources that best support research. This includes research IT staff, librarians, folks up at LBL, um, domain experts, and students like myself. We're the for first point of contact for researchers and we help researchers leverage consult, um, computing and data resources and do so by understanding the aspects of their research uh, that could be aided by computational and data science methodologies and by helping them gain access to those resources. We provide education and outreach by developing training materials um, in response to researcher needs and assisting with the camp campus's overall training and outreach programs. And we also document solutions to research challenges by contributing and expanding documentation um, based on researcher needs and also documenting use cases as we encounter them to inform new service development. Um, so please do let us know if you encounter anything in the docs that you think could be improved. Um, and finally, I'll mention that we hold weekly virtual office hours at these times listed here, um, but we're also happy to schedule appointments at other times. And you can always email us at research-it at berkeley.edu. RIT is working with a network of partner organizations on campus, uh, which include the library, the D-Lab, who provide training and con consulting in data science and management, the Division of Computing and Data Science, Computing Data Science and Society's Data Peers Program, which is a team of undergraduate data science consultants. Um, and we also are hoping to expand to other organizations on campus. And we coordinate consulting services to support the growing data and computing needs on campus. We provide comprehensive research data support in areas such as data classification and security, active data management and storage, data visualization, manipulation and data analysis, research methodology and training, and cloud computing, high performance computing and virtual machines. So we have quite a lot of expertise in quite a lot of areas and we'd love to 
work with you. So please do get in touch. And right now we're especially looking for folks working with sensitive data. As I mentioned, SRDC can handle um, P4 data at the highest protection level. Savio is equipped to handle P2, P3, as well as AI. Um, next slide, please. And the final thing I'll mention is that all of these efforts I just talked about can also be found on the recently launched um, campus research data portal. So please uh, go to this link here if you'd like to learn more. And with that, I'll pass it over to Aaron to speak about securing your devices. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Aaron. I'm with the Information Security Office, and I'm going to go over how to secure devices. Um, the following slides are going to show you how to secure devices, and we're presenting this to help you protect your data and device and our university. UC Berkeley has put together a set of standards that all campus affiliates must follow. These nine requirements, known as the Minimum Security Standards for Network Devices, or MSSND, were created to protect both yourself and our campus. Next slide. If your device is connected to the UC Berkeley network or VPN or stores, processes, or accesses UC Berkeley data hosted at any location, such as Google G Suite or Box, these requirements apply to you. To get started, the security office has put together step-by-step -step instructions on security.berkeley.edu. If you personally manage a Windows, Mac, Android, or iOS device, these instructions can help you bring your device into compliance and protect it from threats. The instructions go over all applicable MSSD requirements, such as patching, anti-malware protection, passphrase requirements, and more. When you get to the page, you will find all of the requirements. Click on the hyperlinked header to view more information about each guideline. You can find the instructions for your Windows, Mac, Android or iOS device underneath each guideline. Once you click on the gray bar to expand the section, you will see shorthand instructions followed by a link to a PDF with full instructions and screenshots. Now I'll go over the MSSND items covered in the how-to and briefly explain how to meet each requirement and why we require it. MSSND 1 is about keeping your operating system and software up to date. A security patch or update protects against known security vulnerabilities. Keeping the software up to date incorporates the best protection possible. So take advantage of the built-in security features of your operating system and apply security updates to software such as Microsoft Office, Google Chrome, and Zoom. This MSSMD2, the security patches mentioned in the last step only work if you have your anti-malware features turned on. The impact of malware can range from minor system performance issues to complete hard drive deletion to full remote control of a system by an attacker. Anti-malware features can detect malware before it infects or has potential to do anything malicious to your computer. Firewalls protect your device from network-based attacks. MSSMD3 requires that host-based firewalls be enabled and configured. Attackers look for networks exposed by devices with insufficient restrictions to introduce viruses or worms and conduct malicious activity over the network. To enable proper protection, you must enable the rule that denies any outbound traffic that is not specifically necessary. To comply with MSSND 5, passphrases and pins must be complex and follow MSSND guidelines, which can be found at security.berkeley.edu. A password manager, like LastPass, can securely store your passphrases and can generate long unique passphrases that meet MSSND5 requirements. Password managers save your passphrases and autofill them when you need them, freeing you to use long, complicated passphrases that you normally wouldn't be able to remember. Tomorrow, ISO will go over LastPass Premium, which is now available to students, staff, and faculty. Poor passphrases can be easily guessed or cracked by attackers, giving them access to your systems. Generally, the longer and more complex the passphrase, the more difficult it is for an attacker to crack. 
your complex passphrase is of no use if your device is left unlocked and someone accesses it. To adhere to your MSMD6, after 15 minutes of activity, your device must lock and require a passphrase to unlock. The passphrase or PIN must follow the passphrase guidelines from MSSMD5. Finally, MSSMD9 requires that your device be configured with separate accounts for administrator and user access. The administrator account should be used sparingly and most days you will not need it. Browsing the internet, answering email, or working with files should be done using a regular user account. Create a separate administrator account to be used only when elevated privileges are needed. Here are some risks to using an administrator account. If your account gets infected by malware, the administrator account will allow the malware to bypass all security and access controls. If you commit an accidental error, you'll be able to delete important files or change configurations. Your device can be compromised through a network service account. All of these instructions are on security.berkeley.edu. If you've gone through the steps and still need support, please reach out to us at security at berkeley.edu. All right, thank you so much, Erin, for that. Um, so I wanna take the time now to open it up for questions. I think we have a couple that came in. Um, so Viviana, if you wouldn't mind reading off some of those so we can get started. And I also just quickly, I think I will stop the recording so that folks can feel free to ask questions that they may necessarily not want recorded. So I'll do that now. 